Hi, I'm Dianis Cook, and this is my husband, Bob. <laughs> and this week, as we remember the second week of Advent, we'll be lighting a candle that represents the joy we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we are just so grateful for your Son. And we are just filled with joy at knowing him and having our sin forgiven and having a gift of eternal life and all the blessings of your spirit and your word and the fellowship of your body, the church. Thank you for this. We just pray again, you'll continue to guide us and provide us the joy that comes only from knowing you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, amen. Give it up for the Cook family, would you? Man, it is good to be with you on this first Sunday in December. Can you believe it is December already? I don't know about you, but November felt like a blur, and, and Christmas is quickly approaching. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and open them up to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 39 through 45 today. But this is our second week in what we're calling an Advent journey. Uh, we are exploring the themes of Advent and understanding that, that this is a season of preparation and anticipation of the coming Messiah, where we as the people of God celebrate with other Christians and other churches around the world of refocusing our hearts and minds on the coming of Jesus. And this has been such an important thing for our church that, that we decided that all of our age groups would be going through this together. So right now in our kids' uh, facilities, whether in preschool or in the kids' center, in our student ministry, we are all exploring this together. And I hope as families that you're spending some time together going through the devotionals and, and really looking at what does it mean to celebrate Advent, to celebrate the coming of the Messiah. Last week, we, we kicked it off by looking at the, the first Advent candle of hope. And we explored the idea that biblical hope is not this pie-in-the-sky thinking. It's not wishful thinking or, or grasping at straws. Biblical hope is grounded in a confident expectation. It's this confidence that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. It's an expectation that God's character is as such that if he says it, it will happen. And we explored this through the lens of the book of Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets. And probably most of us have not spent a lot of time in Malachi. But we saw as we looked at this prophet who, who stands before the people of God, 70 to 100 years after they've come out of exile, and they hear this word of the prophet that says, hey, listen, you guys are still doing it wrong. You are dishonoring me. And the people reply, how are we dishonoring you? And Malachi responds back with unclean sacrifice, robbing God of your tithes and offerings, and, and using his name in such a way that doesn't believe in his power, his authority. And then you get to chapter 4, and normally we would see God speaking to the people, saying, you're going into exile. Not this time. And the prophet Malachi says, I'm going to send this one who will prepare the way of the Messiah. He will be the new Elijah and will move in power. And then silence. Silence. The book of Malachi ends and there's 400 years of silence. No angels, no prophets, no word from the Lord, just silence. And last week we explored this man named Zechariah, who all of a sudden in these mundane priestly duties, he goes into the most holy place and there's the altar of incense and there's an angel standing there and speaks to him. The silence is broken and the angel says, Zechariah, you and your wife are going to have a son, and you will call him John, and he will move in the power of Elijah. And now Malachi has been fulfilled. God said it, therefore it will happen. We can have a confident hope. We can have a confident expectation because of God's character. And that was week one of Advent. And this week, we now light the second candle. And this week's theme is joy. Now, it's widely known by most people in here. I am not a fan of celebrating uh, Christmas before Thanksgiving. 
Anyone else with me in that? Like, you, Christmas needs to happen after Thanksgiving. The rest of you need Jesus. We'll talk about it later. But I love having Thanksgiving as a standalone holiday. Thank you. Preach. Like, I need some interaction here. Uh, I, I love the idea of, of Thanksgiving and giving thanks and then getting the stuff out for Christmas. Well, this year, my beautiful bride, who would celebrate Christmas come July, wanted... <laughs> How dare you? Uh, who wants it early and right, like really early? She was like, sweetie, could you please like pull out the stuff this year before Thanksgiving? And I looked at it and I said, sweetheart, no. And then she was like demanded more like harshly. And I was like, yes, dear. Happy wife, happy life. Happy wife, happy life. And so I got the stuff out early this year, and we put those things up, and she celebrated early and started doing all the things, and I kept holding out till after Thanksgiving. And now, after Thanksgiving, I am in full-blown Christmas mode. Anyone else with me? Like, I've got all the stuff. We've got our house decorated. We've got the lights on. We, we finished, I finished up my Christmas shopping yesterday. Hallelujah. I'm done with that portion of it. I've got Christmas music playing in my car. Last night, our family and a few friends, we went to the movie theater and we watched the greatest Christmas movie ever, Elf. Like, it was so good to sit there, Francisco, that's a great name. Like, we, we love doing those. There's something about it that just brings joy, isn't there? This next week, we'll go and look at the lights at Rama and the Garden of Lights in Muskogee. Uh, a few years ago, I bought Karen a record player, and one of the things that she's been missing from her collection of old 80s music is a good Christmas album, and so she bought the Bing Crosby Christmas album, and that's been playing throughout the, the, the nights, and there's something about carols that brings about Christmas spirit, isn't there? Christmas carols like have this, this power to elicit response in us. We're all familiar with, with Christmas carols, aren't we? Like, yeah, Christmas movies are great. Like, there's something about watching a good Christmas movie, like, uh, you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Like, those are good ones. Or my, the other great one, Die Hard, am I, am I right? Like, yeah. it's a Christmas movie. And there's something about those that are great. But Christmas carols, oh, they're the best. Like, well, you can't go anywhere right now and not hear Christmas carols playing in the background, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's at the mall, whether it's down the street, Christmas carols elicit this response. One of the most well-known is joy to the world, right? Joy to the world. All I have to do is just say the name and immediately in your mind, you can picture the words. Immediately, you know that first refrain. And as those song, that song is sung, all of a sudden, it's now infectious, meaning it's in your brain for the next 24 hours. You can't shake it. There is something about Christmas that elicits joy inside of us. And I believe this to be true because the reason this happens is because Christmas is supposed to bring joy for all people everywhere. The whole story of Christmas is about joy. It's about bringing joy to the world. And Luke's gospel does a really good job of, of bringing about this narrative for us. Luke's gospel kicks off with this man named Zechariah. We talked about him last week. This man who, who's a godly man, and he and his, his wife are, are uh, without children. And they're very old. And they are now promised this son that will go in the power of Elijah and God breaks his silence with this man, not with anybody else, but with this man. And they go home and they find out they're with child. And Zechariah doesn't believe it. And so he's unable to speak for the entire pregnancy. And ladies, some of you are probably like, boy, that would have been nice. But the entire pregnancy, the husband can't complain. And they go into this next section, and Scripture tells us Elizabeth stayed in seclusion for five months. And scripture's quiet on this, but I believe that they did this because Elizabeth is in old age. There's probably some concerns about how this pregnancy is going to turn out. Yes, the angel said it, but there's still a little bit in the background of I'm old, so I'm going to stay in the, the shadows for a little while. 
But as this happens, we, we, we recognize she's in her second trimester. Now, in the sixth month of her pregnancy, the angel Gabriel appears to this young woman named Mary. All of us know the story, right? You don't even have to be Christian to know about Mary. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, let me set the framework because it's going to mean a lot for what we're going to talk about today. But Mary is a young girl, probably a teenager, She's engaged to be married to this man named Joseph. They're engaged, and she's never been with a man. She's a virgin. And this angel appears to her and says, Mary, you are highly favored, and through you the Messiah will be born. Mary's perplexed because she's, she's a virgin, so she asks the angel, how can this be? And Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit of God will come upon you and will overshadow you In fact, so that you know that this is true, your relative, Elizabeth, is actually pregnant with child. And so Mary, hearing this, responds with, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She receives the word of the Lord. What I love is what happens next. Mary departs from her home in Galilee. That's where she's living And she travels to see her relative Elizabeth. And I love how scripture describes this journey. Look at verse 39 with me. It says, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. (laughs) I love this. There's no name of this town given where Elizabeth lives. We know that Mary lives in, in Galilee. And let's be clear. Galilee is not a metropolis. Galilee is actually this little small country town. Like they call them country folk around here, right? This is a country town in the middle of of nowhere. And and throughout the New Testament, Galilee we see is made fun of. Like what good can come from Galilee is one of the, the statements we'll see there. This town is looked down upon. So Mary is traveling from this country town to hill country town, if you know what I'm talking about. Backwater I'm not going to say Oklahoma, backwater Arkansas. Like that is the type of trip she's making. And this is a long journey. Like this is not traveling from Broken Arrow to Coweta. And even as I say that, I don't mean Coweta is hill country folk. Like that's not what I mean. I don't need the emails. It's not a, it's not a get on the highway and get to the next city. It's 70 or 80 miles on foot by herself, young teenage girl. This would have taken her days to get there. And I got to think along the way, Mary is thinking, what am I going to tell Elizabeth? What am I going to say that this angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, hey, you're with child, though you've never been with a man? Who's going to believe that story? And she's got to be thinking through those first opening words that she's going to share with Elizabeth She's got to be thinking of what type of response will her family give around this news. This is what happens, verse 40, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now let's stop here for a moment because we can miss something. In this time and in this culture, the normal Jewish greeting that you would give to a person is shalom alikem. I know it's a weird way of saying something, but it is peace upon you. That is how you would greet someone. You would go to them and say shalom alikem, peace upon you. And the response would be alikem shalom, upon you be peace. That is your standard greeting. And so Mary walks inside Zechariah's home. She looks at Elizabeth and says, Shalom, Alakim. And the response is different. The baby inside of Elizabeth leaps. Let me talk to you moms for a moment. Moms, do you remember your pregnancies? Maybe you've had multiple kids. Maybe you had one kid. Do you remember the time of being pregnant? Uh, In talking with moms, they will tell you every pregnancy is different, right? Every one of them has its uniqueness, has its own little flair and different things about it that are are challenges or or fun. Karen and I were actually, a couple weeks ago, we were reminiscing about her her pregnancies and and talking about her being pregnant with with Isabella. And I got to tell you, uh, that pregnancy with Bella 
was really hard on me. <laughs> it was. Karen had morning sickness, morning, noon, and night, and in the middle of the night. It was awful. At any moment, she could hurl. Like, it was, it was like randomly, all of a sudden, why are you puking? And she, we had to, we got so bad, we were carrying plastic bags in the car, and on more than one occasion, we had to use the plastic bag. Like, it was awful. And the pregnancy was challenging, but then we got to Caleb, our second child. And I got to tell you, it was a lot easier on me. I knew what to expect. I understood what was, what was coming, but it was uniquely different. One of the ways it was uniquely different is in how uh, the kids moved. Uh, you talk to any mom, and they can tell you about what it is to have that feeling of, of a baby moving inside of you. And as men, we don't get it. We don't understand anything about it. And it's nothing we will ever be able to experience. But there's something about being able to feel the baby move and an elbow going across the top of a stomach and watching the foot pushing through like it's an alien trying to escape. Like there's something about it that just brings joy to a mother. But every baby is different. Each baby is unique. Some babies are, are more restful inside of the womb where they're just totally content being snuggled up for nine months inside of, of the womb and just are gentle movers. And then there's the violent ones that hate you for keeping them cooped up, where they are literally kicking you through your body and you feel every aspect of it. And that was Caleb. Caleb, we used to joke, would be a professional soccer player because he kicked Karen so hard. Karen actually thought she broke ribs because of our son. <laughs> good times. So good to be a man. But every one of them is uniquely different. And to feel a baby move is something special. And then we look at this story and we see that, that this baby in Elizabeth is moving and we could think that it's something normal, but there's something uniquely supernatural about this. There's something about this moment when Mary speaks, the voice of Mary speaks, and the baby leaps and the Holy Spirit of God comes upon Elizabeth. And instead of your standard response of Alechem Shalom, upon you be peace, this is what Elizabeth responds with. Verse 42, in a loud voice she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. Now this is key. They've just met it's been days since Mary found out she was going to be with child, and she has been greeted by Elizabeth with a loud voice, an excited voice, that blessed are you, and blessed is the child, knowing she's pregnant, that you will bear. It's amazing, because Elizabeth says, listen, you are in a place of privilege, now, let's be clear. This is not to say that we are to worship Mary, that she's in a place of, of worship. It is to confirm that she is uh, affirming what the Holy Spirit has, has spoken through the angel, Gabriel, to her, that you are a blessed woman. This is confirmation that you are with child. This story that you heard from an angel, it's not that far-fetched because now your, your relative is speaking about it even before you have said anything about it. News can't travel that fast. It's a day's journey. And the Holy Spirit speaks through Elizabeth to Mary. And I love what happens next in verse 43. And how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? My Lord. What Elizabeth has just stated there is that the Messiah is inside of you. We need to realize how remarkable these words are. In this time and place where Mary should be giving like honor to Elizabeth because Elizabeth is in her old age and this is a miracle that she is pregnant with this child. Instead, what we find is that Elizabeth is affirming Mary about the coming of the Messiah. Yeah, it's great, Elizabeth. You have the, the, the one that's going to be the front runner of the Messiah. He will pave the way. He will move in power of Elijah. But Mary, what you have, my Lord... And this is why verse 44 is so powerful. 
As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Elizabeth says, the moment I heard your voice, the moment my baby heard your voice, we knew what was happening. The Messiah has come. And it brings joy to all people. It brings joy to the baby. It brings joy to Elizabeth. And I think what can happen in our world, in our culture, is we miss the joy that was meant that first Christmas, that led up to that first Christmas, the why we should be joyful in all seasons, the why joy should abound in every Christian, regardless of what happens in our world. We should have joy. And so today I want to explore two reasons why every Christian, regardless of circumstance, can experience joy this holiday season. And the first reason is this. You can experience joy because Jesus did what you cannot do. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to write that down. Jesus did what you cannot do. If you've got your Bible still open to uh, to Luke, I want you to go back to Matthew. It's two books to your left. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is called the Sermon on the Mount. You might be familiar with it. At the beginning of this sermon, it's Jesus on a mountainside speaking to the people. And he starts out by giving these blessed statements. Things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Right? Blessed are the peacemakers. He gives these blessed statements that are turning this world upside down of who is actually blessed in the coming kingdom of God. But then Jesus shifts gears and he turns his focus on expanding and expounding upon the Old Testament law. Jesus says things like, you've heard it once said that you shall not murder. If you murder, you will be under judgment. And every one of us will be like, well, duh, that makes sense. Like, murder is bad. You should be judged if you commit murder. But then Jesus goes on and says, ah, but let me tell you, anyone who has anger against his brother or sister, they are under the same judgment. And Jesus does this for three chapters. Jesus continues to tell his audience that, listen, if you're angry, if you do these things, he elevates the level of what it means to be righteous, what it means to abide by the law of Moses. And the Jewish audience has to be hearing these things and and thinking to themselves, those are all sin. I commit murder, I sin. Now you're telling me if I am angry with my brother, I commit the same sin and I'm under judgment. Who can measure up to this standard? And Jesus is explaining this. He's elevating the standard, not diminishing the standard. He says, this is all sin. And sin's a word we throw around as Christians quite a bit. And sin is the imperfection of the perfection of God. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, it is us missing God's perfect standard. Whether rebelling intentionally or rebelling and not knowing. We miss the standard, this perfection, whether we miss it by a centimeter or we miss it by five miles. It is a miss of the perfect standard of God. And it's because of that sin, we are separated from relationship with God. And Jesus says, listen, you've heard don't murder because it's sin. You'll face judgment for it. And I'm telling you, if you're angry with your brother or sister, it's sin and you're under judgment for it. I don't know about you, but as I've grown older and and more mature in my walk with the Lord, I read the Sermon on the Mount, and I am consistently struck by how far I am from the standard of God, of how frequently I fall short of God's perfect standard Jesus sets this bar high, and as much as I strive under my own power to reach that standard, I fall short. Daily, I fall short. And for those that think that they can get right with God based off their good deeds, based off of leveling things out, based off of how good I am, let me tell you, friend, you will never measure up because the standard is too high. We will never Balance out our sinfulness with our good works. 
We will never be able to do enough good to balance the books of what we have done wrong in the eyes of God against God and against one another. And no matter how good we are, and we should do a lot of good in our world, we will never balance out the sin in our lives. And just when it seems hopeless and helpless, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 puts things in perspective. Look at it with me. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to, keyword, fulfill them. This verse alone should like be our life verse. It is a liberating verse for people who follow Jesus. Jesus fulfills the law. Jesus goes by the law and accomplishes everything we cannot do. He lives the law perfectly. He never misses the mark of God's perfect standard. He does what we cannot do. He fulfilled the law. He was sinless when we are sinful. He made sure that he abided by every word of the law and the heart of the law to the point that no one else can compare. No one will be able to do what Jesus has done. And that is extremely liberating when we put it in perspective of eternity. And here's a key thing. I want you to write this down because this is a key phrase for us that I think helps us understand this. Jesus doesn't expect you to be sinless. He just wants you to sin less. Jesus never expects you to be without sin. Jesus never calls you to be perfect all the time. That's where grace, that's where forgiveness comes into play. That's why he came was to bring us forgiveness and salvation because he knows we can't do it. What he asks is that we do our part in sinning less. As we walk in step with the Holy Spirit of God, as we allow the Spirit of God to sanctify us, to make us more in the image of Jesus Christ, we should sin less each and every day. But we will never be sinless. We will just walk with less sin each and every day. Jesus does what we cannot do. He doesn't sin. He abides by the law of Moses in every way. And fulfills it to its completion. That's the first reason why we can have joy. The second reason goes hand in hand with that. The second reason is this. Jesus paid our debt. I I think for us it's a, a bit overwhelming to understand the debt that we have with God. We were in sermon prep a couple weeks ago talking about this. This sermon, and I shared this idea of debt, and we sat there and we tried to rack our brains around what could we possibly tell people that would signify the debt that we have to God. And we couldn't come up with a really good answer. We tried different things, like what if someone came and paid off your mortgage for you and you were underwater? How much, how much freedom would you find in your life? And that's not even coming close to the debt that we have in the eyes of God. We talked about having someone be a slave and be freed, and that doesn't even come close to the debt that we have with God because, friends, we all have sinned, and there is a debt that must be paid. Because of sin, judgment is handed down to those who have broken the law. There is a debt. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul quotes from Deuteronomy, and he says, Cursed is anyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. For anyone who is under the law, anyone who has sinned, they are cursed. They are under judgment. And that judgment is separation from God, both in this life and into eternity. And there's a debt that has to be paid. And the Bible tells us that there cannot be forgiveness of sin without bloodshed. The entire Old Testament sacrificial system was to appease that need. That without bloodshed, we cannot get out from underneath the curse of sin. We are in bondage. We are slaves to that sin. We have a debt that has to be paid And in the Old Testament, a lamb or goat was placed 
in that spot to atone, to cover the sins of the people for one year and for centuries that went on and Jesus comes. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus, the holy, spotless Lamb of God, Jesus was born to die. He came to live a sinless life to pay our debt, to atone for our sins. I love how 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 speaks of this. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Jesus has no sin. He becomes sin for us. He bears the consequence of our sins on that cross. He pays the debt. He redeems us. He buys us back from the bondage of sin and death and brings us into the eternal inheritance that comes in following him. I love how the rest of that verse goes on to say, so that in him, we who are sinful, who are sinners, we so that in him might become the righteousness of God. In him, in Jesus, we become righteousness. We become in right standing before God. When we place our faith in Jesus, when we are there in him, we find we are made righteousness. Yes, he was able to do what we could not do. He was the perfect sacrifice and he paid our debt on that cross. And in him, we find the fullness of joy. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those of us in Christ Jesus, you are not condemned. You are made free. Jesus fulfills the law that we can't ever measure up to. Jesus lives a sinless life, fulfilling the law of Moses in every way. He pays the price with his life on a Roman cross so that he pays our debt for us. And in him, there's no condemnation. I recognize, friends, that life is hard. And there are a lot of reasons to not find joy in this life. If anything that 2020 has taught me is that if our joy is placed in the things of this world and the circumstances of this world, it is easy for our joy to be robbed. Trials and tribulations will rob you of your joy. Getting laid off from your job will rob you of your joy. Joy. Losing a loved one will rob you of your joy. Hard circumstances in this life will rob you of your joy. But friends, joy is not based. True joy is not based in the happenings of this world. True joy is based in the person of Jesus Christ and the work he did for us. The baby, John the Baptist, leaps with joy inside of Elizabeth. Elizabeth proclaims excitedly about my Lord has come. They recognize what we need to recognize. It's in Jesus coming we find joy. Because he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And he pays our debt, a debt we could never repay him. And he does this for his people. And he asks us that we come before him, making him Lord of our lives and walking in step with his spirit. We've been freed by Jesus and the work that he's done on the cross. And friends, I don't know what else should bring us more joy than knowing we inherit eternal life because Emmanuel, God with us, has come to die for us. And in him... We are the righteousness of God. Oh, this holiday season should bring us so much joy as we focus on that. Oh, this holiday season should bring us so much joy in knowing what Jesus has done and knowing what he has sacrificed on our behalf. Regardless of what happens these next few weeks as we lead into Christmas, we have joy because of Emmanuel, God with us. And his name is Jesus. And I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey today. Maybe you're here, you were invited by someone, maybe you're joining us online and checking us out and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. I'm here to tell you true joy 
is for you. And true joy is found in the person of Jesus. He did what you cannot do. He lived a sinless life, something that you are unable to do. And he paid your debt, a debt you will never be able to pay. Why? So that you might inherit eternal life. In a moment, I'm going to pray us out and then go through some announcements. But afterwards, I would love to talk to you if that's you and you want to make Jesus Lord of your life. I'll be standing right up here at the front. I would love to talk to you about it. We understand in Scripture that we are called to make disciples. And as we look to the New Testament, we see there are four things that that we see in Scripture of what it means to make Jesus Lord. Number one, it begins with faith in him. Jesus is who he says he is. He is Lord of all. He is Savior. He is the Son of God, God in the flesh. Number two, we confess him as Lord. We live under his rule and his reign, submitting ourselves to that. We confess him as Lord, but we also repent of our sins. We turn from our sins and turn to Jesus. And lastly, we see that baptism is part of that journey, that we all need to be baptized. I would love to walk you through that if that's you. And if you're joining us online, I would love for you to hit that connect button, letting me know, and I will reach out to you this week and walk you through what that looks like. For us as Christians, what I love about this Advent and what this Advent journey is doing in me is it's recentering and refocusing where my life is. Is my joy in the things of this world, as I look at this candle and I see it lit, I'm reminded my joy should be found in Jesus. And in that, nothing can rob that joy. Let me pray. God, we, we love you. And Father, I am so incredibly grateful for this journey that I've been on in Advent and looking at these themes of hope and now joy. God, I'm so incredibly grateful that Jesus does what I cannot do. I cannot live up to your perfect standard. I fall short time and time again, and yet because of Jesus... I don't sit under judgment. I don't sit under your wrath because he paid that debt. I'm so incredibly grateful, God, that I can experience joy this season regardless of what happens in the world around me, knowing that my joy is most filled in the person of Jesus Christ. And for God, uh, God, for anyone here that, that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they would step out and encourage and in faith today to make you Lord. And for the rest of us who are Christian, that we would go into this very dark world and we would bring the joy that comes from Jesus Christ and make disciples, helping people come to know the fullness of joy found in the person of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus, his first coming to this earth to bring salvation his second coming to restore all things and to bring a new heaven and new earth. We thank you for that. It's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen.